Okay, so we're going to begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are very thankful for the Sabbath that's coming, uh, for all your blessings of this past week, and for the opportunity to rest. Um, we are thankful, Lord, for uh, the, the work that you have been doing upon our hearts uh, throughout this week as we have studied your word and you've revealed to us our need of you in a deeper way. Uh, we pray for each person. We know the struggles that, that each of us face are sometimes our own, um, and we can seem very alone with those struggles. But we know, Lord, that you are close to us, that you understand all of our needs. And we pray, Lord, that we can encourage one another with the truth and that we can obey you in all things and that we can reflect your character. We ask, Lord, now that as we study together and as we open your word, uh, that we can see wonderful things out of thy law, the things that will reveal Christ. Be with each person. Again, we ask through your Holy Spirit, may your angels gather around us and may this Sabbath truly be a blessing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Okay, so I want to look at um, a Bible verse here. So I got to open up a couple things. You know, I've been thinking a lot about um, <clears throat> uh, different things. One is people send me questions all the time. And, and that gets me studying a little bit. And, and we, we had completed this study on the week of Christ. At least it's, it's sort of complete. I don't think I'm ever uh, completely finished in studying Daniel chapter 9. Um, but I, I do want to look at this, this verse here that we've studied. So we've studied uh, Daniel 9 verse 24 to 27. And I just want to focus on, on this one part. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, we had done a study dealing with uh, the many and the few. So the word many in, in the King James, uh, I don't know if that's really a great translation of the word. Um, it's the word rap, right? And... It seems to be used in Daniel in a, in a special sense. Uh, so who would Jesus have confirmed the covenant with many for one week? Who, who, what is the many? Anybody with any thoughts on that? All those who are looking forward to uh, his promise? Uh, from clear back in Abraham and before. Okay. Back in Genesis, so, maybe. So we, we go back to this covenant, right? So we know that there's a covenant. There's a covenant made um, in, with Abraham, but that's not the first covenant. We know there was a covenant with Noah. And we could even say that there was a covenant made with, with Adam and Eve. So when it says he shall confirm the covenant, with many, we could say, well, it's those that he made a covenant with in the past. So would this include the Jews, the Jewish nation? Did he make a covenant, confirm a covenant with the Jewish nation? Maybe as individuals. Okay. Now, part of the thing is this word confirm. So, you know, we have a translation. You have to put the Hebrew word into some kind of English, English word. The word confirm, gabar, means to be strong um, by implication to prevail. So one of the things you can do with a word like this is you can, uh, I use the King James Concordance. It's the easiest way to look at it. 
and you can find all the place that this word shows up. So we just kind of, you know, just sort of take it, confirm the covenant, you know, how do you confirm a covenant? What is that referring to? It's referring to some kind of prevailing uh, that goes on. And, and yet we just kind of gloss over these terms because we, we dealt with this week of Christ. And in this week of Christ, we saw that there was uh, this line that went up to the, to the stoning of Stephen in 34 AD. But we could also connect that week of Christ to our time by looking at the years, a year for a day or a day for a year, going backwards on, on the bottom. So we could we line that up. So um, this word confirm is used in Genesis 7, verse 18 and 19, um, when the waters prevailed. So the waters prevailed um, upon the earth, increased greatly. Um, and, and you can see here, prevailed, 1396. And the waters prevailed exceedingly. So you're not going to think of the waters prevailing as confirming anything, right? So when we have that it's confirmed, um, that's really, to me, even though it's translated that way in the King James, it's not necessarily the best word. It doesn't tell us much about the word itself. Because uh, confirm... Um, the word now what does the word prevail like what's the what does prevail and confirm mean like if we went back to these words and we looked at their origins their etymology what does confirm mean if we broke that word down and what does prevail mean how, how come they're related to each other in this context anybody know Because con means together, right? Right? So, and confirm. So confirm, firm is, uh, uh, means to uh, um, make firm or firmer. So firm, the word firm comes, it's, it's related. So if we make, if we confirm something, what do we do? Well, Exodus 17, 11. You're establishing, maybe establishing something. Well, you bring it together, right? Mm -hmm. So confirm means to bring something together and to make it strong. Now, what about prevail? What does that mean? Right, so uh, the one that we have here is Israel attacks Amalek, 1711. It came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So what does the word prevail mean? Sounds like they're getting the upper hand. Okay, but I mean, the, the origin of the word. Pre means before right? Like, you know, pretext. That means before. Yeah, you're getting ahead of something. Yeah, and veil is, is it means to have power, right? The velure, Latin. Uh, so, it, so it comes to mean have, uh, to show power before something, to have greater power, prevail. Um, so why are these two different words translated by the Hebrew word? Um, which, which word it was? It was, um, just hang on a sec, garbar or something. It's not a word I'm too familiar with. Um, right, so that word was, yeah, gabar, right? So, so that word means to be strong. So why would prevail and confirm that really don't seem similar in English? The question is, why are they translated this way? So 
we know that that's a problem with translation, right? You have a word, it means something, but we can translate it into other words. So what does the word mean based upon the fact that we can translate it as confirm, uh, to, to bring together to make something strong or prevail? And, and here in this one, it's a little bit different than in Genesis. Because in Genesis 7, 18, when the waters prevail, what do we think about the waters prevailing? They overcome against all odds. Or they overcame the top of the highest mountains. Right. So, so they, 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 but, you know, I don't know if the word prevail means to, um, uh, you know, to have power over so that, the waters overpowered the earth, you could say, overcome. you know, they overcame the earth. So they came over the earth, right? Overcome means came over. Um, but in Christ confirming the covenant, then how would we line up that word in, in Christ confirming the covenant? What is he doing with the covenant? We, okay see that's that's not what it that's not what the word means right I so understand. Think of the word confirm to mean sort of uh put a stamp of approval on it sort of authenticate it right if you're going to confirm you, you know if you're going to uh, make a bank deposit and you know or transfer you know and then it's confirmed you know the money's in there yeah, can... that's not what the hebrew word means or that's it doesn't mean that kind of confirm, right? Just because you can translate a Hebrew word into an English word doesn't mean you can take all the meanings of that English word and apply it to that Hebrew word. So if we look at it as the word of prevailed, uh, he, he shall prevail or the, the covenant shall be prevailed. He shall make the covenant prevail for one week. How would we think of that differently? So what is the covenant doing if it's prevailing? But wasn't he that was doing it? Yeah, but he's gonna he's gonna cause this covenant to prevail. He's gonna prevail the covenant. So the question is, is he prevailing over the covenant? Or is he making the covenant prevail? Yeah, it shouldn't it? Yeah. It means, or we mean that to give strength to, to the covenant? Yeah. Yeah, that's what he's doing. He's giving strength to the covenant. Right? So it's not just that he's confirming it in the sense that we would think of a, a weak sort of way of looking at confirm, like he's, he's just established you know he's confirming it it like yeah it's the covenant right you know i confirming the covenant it's it's established in some way but it's actually causing it to prevail so what did christ do in that covenant week what is what is being described here Now, he's, we also know that in the midst of the week, he's going to cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. And, and that word cease is related to the word Sabbath. Right? It seems to me we have to think about Jesus in his human form as well. So, I mean, there are several ways you could say he prevailed mm -hmm. um, and brought about the, the covenant. You know that he promised back to Adam and Eve, mm -hmm. and to Abraham and others. Yeah. So, you know, one way we can look at it, just in the idea of salvation, what Jesus accomplished at the cross. What does it accomplish for us? What does it mean to us? Opportunity. Okay. Opportunity. For salvation. Okay, it's salvation, but it, it salvation from what? Sin. 
So he saves, he'll save his people from their sins, right? That's what Christ came to do. And so he has actually confirmed that covenant. He is, now we could say fulfilled the covenant. And in some ways that, that also is a helpful word, except that that's not what the word says. It has to do with prevailed, right? Um, he shall prevail the covenant with many for one week. You know, if we just it's kind of awkward English or make the covenant prevail with many for one week. Now, so then who's the many? In, in, the con, in, in Daniel, we studied this. You have the many and the some. So who's the many? Generally speaking, when you're talking about the many. In contrast to the some. Many that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So who is the many? John 3.16 tells us he gave his life for, for the world. Yeah. So, so the many, it, and, and this goes to this, this problem, this, sometimes it's a semantical issue. Because Jesus died for all men, but not all men are saved. Right. Did he strengthen that covenant for many? Or just for some? In what terms are you thinking of strengthening? Well, he says he shall confirm, which, which we can kind of say to strengthen it or to prevail over it, to make it prevail with many. So he's going to do this with many for one week. In the midst of the week, he shall cause sacrifice and oblation to cease, right? And then what you're going to have happen, the next part is the destruction of Jerusalem. So, so Christ did something for many here in confirming the covenant. So the question is, who is the many? Once he chose salvation, or he choose salvation? Okay, well, how many, how many, is it going to be many or few that are saved? Few. Okay, few. So why is it saying here many, when many means the majority, right? Well, he gave many the opportunity, but only okay. some will choose. Right. And, and, and we can see that because what's going to happen? Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. So even though Christ comes and he confirms this covenant, he strengthens it. He causes it to prevail with many for one week. It still is not going to accomplish for Jerusalem because he's confirming this covenant for Jerusalem. Right? We can agree with that. That it's not just for those people at the end of the world. What Jesus did was for everyone. And this covenant that that he's talking about is the covenant made with Abraham because we've connected this chiastic structure to Abraham. And so this is God's people. Um, right. And we know that Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Right. So this is not for himself that he's doing this. He's doing it for his people. And uh, so that many that he does it for, not all of them accept it. Because this was an issue back in 1996, where we had Jack Sakira from the 1888 Message Study Committee teaching that all men have been justified by what Jesus did on the cross. Now, sometimes those arguments can be semantical. That is, they can just be arguing words. Because, and, and, and people will do, um, will, they'll take one meaning of the word one time and they use another meeting of the word the other time and they really confuse you they're not being very clear in what they're saying they try to say something in a sort of a provocative way to get you to think but it becomes misleading right it's not clear communication and but i still think jack sakira had a lot of wrong ideas i don't think it's just a matter of of semantics that he was just saying something that didn't sound right 
he, he had a lot of false ideas, direct statements that contradict the spirit of prophecy. So, do you know where he is? I don't know where Jack Secure is. I, I haven't heard about him. I don't know if he's alive or not. Or, okay, I'm just curious. You know, I, I haven't really heard much about him since the 90s. So, you know, like he wrote his book back, I think, in 92. Um, so, it's a long time ago. It's like 30 years ago. And I don't know how old he was. I don't think he was a young man. So, um, so a lot of those people are gone now. Uh, the people who were involved in all these uh, issues happening in the 1990s. So, um, but it's just something to think about because when we're looking at this, this covenant, uh, I, I don't think that we fully understand what this is all about. I mean, it's easy to, you know, to study these things, to put them on lines. Well, maybe it's not easy, but, you know, we can see some things. We can see that God is leading in this movement. But we're really not always focused on what he's trying to accomplish by this. So uh, I want to go to Stephen's study. Um, hopefully Stephen doesn't get upset with me for doing that. Because uh, he's going to present this stuff on Sunday. Uh, at least part of it. <clears throat> Now, this is a rather, I, I got to switch screens here. Uh, this is a rather involved drawing. So I'll try. Let's see if that works. Okay, that's a little better. I know that's not. There, that's much better. Hopefully people can see this pretty well. Now, I went through a little bit this before we started recording, um, but I just want to look at this, you know, slowly. So we have a Sunday law, March 7th, 321 AD. Uh, we have Constantine with the first Sunday law. Now, we had, when we studied the story of, of Esther, we had connected that Sunday law uh, with the story of Esther and with um, March 7th, 2021. So March 7th, 2021 is tied together uh, numerically or structurally with these events in Esther and with the Sunday Law in 321. And one of the things I did to use to do that was pi. So I used pi and found that there was a ratio of representation that was almost exactly precise uh, from the Sunday Law in 321 back to the story of the Sunday law in Esther. It's not a Sunday law, but um, the 13th day of the 12th month. And, and then tying that also uh, to our time. So this was pretty interesting structure. So 321 AD being a Sunday law. Um, now you'll see at the bottom, this is something that Odilio had pointed out to Stephen, which, which we already knew is that in 1844, uh, the, the Jews, both the rabbinic Jews and the Karaite Jews, marked the first day of the first month as March 21st. So 321 symbolizes March 21st. Um, now, it's also like the day after the spring equinox and um, is the earliest that you could have a, a biblical year if depending on how the equinox lies with the first day of the first month but generally it's what we would call the equinox but the equinox falls actually on 321 according to biblical counting so you have to add the 13th month so in 1844 the millerites when they tried to figure out uh when the 10th day of the seventh month was they had had established that they were using a karate calendar which they weren't um, Karaites don't do what they thought they did. They don't have the year always start one month later than the rabbis, but that's what they believed. They had a source that told them that, or at least they interpreted it that way. And so, so they started the first day of the first month on April 19th. So, so we got March 21st over there, and we have April 19th, the, fourth, uh, the 19th day of the fourth month, later on. We're going to look at that. Now, 
So let's forget about that bottom part for now. So I'm just pointing out what's there. We have this Sunday law, we have this line on the bottom that we're gonna look at. But then what Stephen noticed is that if we count from 321 to the taking away of the daily in 508, it's 187 years. So that's a pretty interesting observation since 187 is a symbol of July 18th. And uh, July 18th in Millerite history is Samuel Snow's last letter being published three days prior to July 21st, which is midnight. So his presentation at Boston at midnight where he declares that it's midnight and that he's giving the midnight cry, behold the bridegroom cometh on the 10th day of the seventh month and that he was midway. And that's what Ellen White talks about is midway. So that July 21st in 1844, if you go from the Sunday law and you count to 538, it's 217 years. So that's the symbol of July 21st. You following this, Heidi? Are you paying attention? Is this making sense, what I'm doing here? I just, because I wanted to show you this. I haven't showed it to you yet. So, <clears throat> so you got these two symbols. So you have the taking away of the daily and the papal dominion. So these being connected to the Sunday law, because this is a Constantine Sunday law, we're now being connected by these two symbols from Millerite history, July 18th and July 21st, to these two way marks. So that's pretty profound in and of itself. You know, none of this is, is future stuff yet. This is just established prophecy. The thing is, we wouldn't have seen the symbol of 187 and, and 217 or, or 217 um, without understanding the things that we understand now. So these become significant. Now, since he's lining July 18th up with 508, we can put July 18th, 1844 under there. So Samuel Snow's last letter. And we're lining the 217 years from the Sunday law to 538. We can put July 21st, 1844 under 538. Now, this was very similar in some ways to what I did with the week of Christ. That is, in the week of Christ, I was placing dates in the week of Christ, going from left to right, chronologically as time normally is drawn by us. Um, and then I was putting years going the opposite direction. Well, here, uh, we're having days and years kind of lining up together, but in, in a particular way, that is 90 years equals 90 days, right? 30 years equals three days. So wouldn't 30 years equal 30 days, right? So you can see it's not quite a precise, you know, day for a year type of thing. Um, sometimes it's, it's just the symbol of 30 years can symbolize 30 days. 90 years can symbolize 90 days, even though you think, well, that would symbolize nine days. Right. So you understand what I'm saying. We're using this symbol of the three and the nine in a way that can expand it or contract it. So, so some differences there. So you've got these 30 years here. And you can see the three days. And that's just natural because of these dates line up here. And then when he's taking these 90 years, this is an inclusive count. So when he has a black asterisk. That's inclusive counting. That is, he's doing an ordinal count. So 419 AD would be the first year. That would be one. And he would count to 508, and that would be the 90th year. But below, he's just counting 90 days from April 19th, 1844 to July 18th, 1844. Now, remember... There's 187 days from the first day of the first month. So April 19th, 1844 is the first day of the first month. That's the first disappointment. And there's 93 days to midnight as a, a cardinal count, however you want to look at it. And then there's 94 days from July 21st 
21st, midnight, to October 22nd as an inclusive chat. So he's, he's sometimes using inclusive, sometimes he's using cardinal, just the normal counting of days. And the interesting thing is we have these dates here. We have the first day of the first month on the rabbinic calendar, and we have the first day of the first month on the biblical calendar. So March 21st and April 19th being marked here. Now, the interesting thing is the year is 419. So 419 AD is 90 years between before 508 in a, what we would call an inclusive count. And so, but I can look on the calendar and see that 90 days before July 18th is April 19th. So to just think how unlikely this is, there's no relationship between these biblical dates and these years, right? It's, it's not a, there's not a logic that says this is inevitable, right? It, you, you see what I'm saying? The fact that that just lines up in that way is extremely unlikely. Is there an event for 419 AD? No, there's no event. So okay. it's just a symbol, right? Yeah. So you don't always need, a, and, and it's a symbol that has these witnesses. The witnesses is the 90 days and the 90 years. But it's, it, it comes from the fact that this is a symbol. 508 and 538 are now, in a sense, being affirmed by this 419 AD lining up with April 19th, 1844. So that becomes just, you know, extremely unlikely. So the fact that that occurs means that we can take that as a symbol. So 419 doesn't have to have something happen on that year. I mean, you could go and look at 419 and you might find some event and you might think it's significant. Um, but what we're doing is we're taking established dates, 321, 508, 538, 1798. And then we have these symbolic years that show that there is a structure here that relates to Millerite history. So the dates of Millerite history, the first day of the first month, July 18th, Samuel Snow's last letter, midnight. July 21st, the fifth day of the fourth month. That's July 21st. And then the first day of the fifth month, Exeter camp meeting, which is August 15th. That's going to show up on this line as well. And, and then we have October 22nd, 1844, the 10th day of the seventh month shows up there. So, so all those dates show up in this structure, but they show up in a symbolic way. So the year is 419 and the year 777 AD and the year 1477, they're symbolical years. They, they're just numbers, but they affirm the structure. So, so we have these dates on the bottom. So let's look at 777. Well, actually, before we get there, let's, let's go to uh, 1477. So what Stephen did is he took this 321 AD that starts this diagram and um, since it brought him to this, the 1290 and the 1260 that are both going to end in 1798, it makes sense to draw the 1260 years here. So he has 1798. And now he's going to count back 321 years. Now he could have, he could have just, um, Well, okay, so he's, he does this here. So this 321 years, he could have just said 1798 minus 321. This whole period is 1477 years, okay? Uh, but he chose to put the year 1477 on his list. Hello, guys. Hi, Mark. Hey. You want to call? Hello, all the way, baby. I say to just for last Wednesday of Minstead Hall Bible Study. Okay. And help me to catch up. 
and I am so sorry for being late gaining of this study now. Okay. Okay, so we're just looking Can at you call me to fill catch up a last day for Bible study <laughs> morning and today morning too. Okay. Well, I'm gonna have to, yeah, I'm gonna have to do a study with you where I get you to catch up. So we'll figure out a time after. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. I let you do it now. It is best. You have no time. No, I don't have time right now. We We're doing study. another study. We didn't have a study this morning. Yeah, we didn't have a study this morning. We just had one. Just now. Yeah. So. Okay. Yes. Um. I can't, Mark. I can't. I can't update you on that study. Now we have to do it at another time because I'm doing a different study right now. What kind? We'll talk about it after this study, okay? Um, I am asking what kind of study you're doing now. Right now we're doing um, a study of this from the Sunday law in 321 AD to the time of the end in 1798. So we're, we're just looking at a chart that Stephen did. Okay. Stephen. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. I know about that fellow. Okay. So anyway, this is Stephen Jameson from Ireland. Oh, that guy, Stephen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what we have here is we have this 1400, 1477 AD. So Stephen chose to put 1477 as a date on the line. Now he could have just said from 321 to 1798 is 1477 years. So he could have just left it at that, but he chose to put it as a date on the line. So he knows that a span of time can relate to a year. Now, nothing happens in 1477, but it is 321 years before 1798. And so when he first put that on the line, he didn't have this 940 years related to 94 days. So he never thought about that. But when we do that, we can line up October 22nd, 1844 with 1477. And, and that's just logical based upon the fact that these are 94 inclusive days, but based upon the fact that if this is midnight, we should be able to put 1844 there, October 22nd, 1844. And the fact that it ends up being 1477 and it's 320 years before 1798 shows that this symbol that he put there first, so he didn't put this here first, he put this here first, that it lines up it shows that there's something correct because that's extremely unlikely that he's going to have October 22nd line up with this 321 Sunday law number creating this whole structure. So without the 321 AD, you don't have this 321 years over here. So I hope people can, can kind of follow what I'm doing or what Stephen is doing, but me trying to explain it that I'm explaining it well is that you just simply, all Stephen has done is he's taken an established prophecy, the 1260 and the 1290, these two time prophecies from Daniel. And he's looked at the Sunday law in 321, and he could just create these years up here based upon that structure. But he also could then create these dates on the bottom from Millerite history. So if you think about the implausibility of this. Um, uh, one is we never would have thought to do this. We never would have thought in the past as Seventh-day Adventists uh, to count from the, from the Sunday law. And we wouldn't have seen the significance of July 18th because we didn't know about July 18th. We didn't know about Samuel Snow's letter and the structures related to it um, until you know 2017. And then again, we had only figured out midnight that 
that Boston um, was midway and that Samuel Snow gave that presentation at Boston on July 21st, we only found that out in, you know, 2000, I think it was the end of 2015, the beginning of 2016. So, so no Adventist would have ever have even conceived of this idea. But now this movement has created this structure, this way of using numbers, that we can look at Millerite history, that it fits in this way with these time prophecies connected to the Sunday law. So that's one of the profound things. Now, um, 1477, we're going to look at that a little bit later. It's the span of time from the Sunday law to 1798. Does it mean anything, it, it, you know, when, when it comes to 1477 AD? You know, there's nothing that happened there that we know of. But the bottom line gives it significance that it's part of this structure. Now, we know that when we had taken the first day of the first month and we had counted to uh, the 10th day of the seventh month, we had counted that as 70 prophetic days. Now, it's actually 68 days, but we had counted it as 70 days. Um, and we did this back in 2014, right? At least we started in 2013 to try to understand the first day of the of the fifth month it happens to be August 15. But what were we doing there? We had 70 days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. And we had 120 days uh, going from the first day of the first month to the first day of the fifth month. So people should remember that, right? That's how we did it. So we had 120 days. What did the 120 days from the first day of the first month to the first day of the fifth month mean? What, what did 120 and 70 symbolize? Anybody remember? The disciples. Was it? Okay, well. Did that come through okay? Okay, so. 120 12 disciples and 120 uh, who were there at the day of Pentecost. I guess you could look at it that way. But we use them as a symbol of priests and Levites, correct? Mm -hmm. Anybody remember that? So why were we why were we using this symbol as priests and Levites? Anybody remember where we got that from? I don't know, but but that one. Okay. Anybody remember? There were two eight-day periods for the cleansing of the sanctuary, but I can't remember the text. Is it Second Kings yeah. somewhere? Yeah. So that was Second Chronicles twenty-nine. There's two periods of eight days, so that was another priest and Levite symbol. So why were we using one hundred and twenty days and seventy days as symbolizing priests and Levites? And who was the priests and who were the Levites? Was it because of the upper room, the people that were in there? Okay, yeah. So, so the 12 disciples gives us a clue and the 120 in the upper room. So those are... Uh, the priest. Now, what about the 70? Uh, wh where would that come from? Is that related to when Jesus sent out the disciples to, uh, throughout Judea, Judea? Yeah, right. So he, he appointed 70, right? Yes. Uh, other 70. So you have the disciples, which is 12, and you have the 70, which is these other disciples. So the 12 
and the 70 symbolize the 120 and the 70. Does that make sense of how he did that? Okay, so I, I think that makes sense to people, right? So that's what he's talking about when he's talking about these 70 days from August 15th, 1844 to October 22nd, 1844. Because if you counted the number of days, it's 68. But symbolically, we used it as 70 because we just used a 30-day month. So you round it, right? Yeah, so that's going to be from uh, the first day of the fifth month to the 10th day of the seventh month. So that's two months and 10 days, 70 days, right? So that's what Stephen's talking about. So if you count back and you take 70 days and you apply it to 700 years, so why would we do that? How come I take, where do I get the idea I can take 70 days and make it into 700 years on the top? 70 is a tenth of 700? Yeah, but I also did the three days and the 30 years between 508 and 538. Which so is the tenth to represent the five. Yeah. The so, tenth represents the remnant, excuse me. Okay. Now, um, I'm looking at some of the stuff on the chat. People are putting a bunch of things there. You can actually speak these things out if you can. Um, yeah, so the 187 is 97 plus 90. 321 to 417 can be seen as 98 years, which is uh, 2 times 7 times 7, so 49 times 2. Um, these are just notes that are being done. 538 plus 86 is 624, a reversal of 426. 321 equals, 3 times 21 equals 63. Uh, part of Jeff Pippinger's Midnight Chiasm, right? It's also a symbol of Pentecost, 63. Uh, four times 19, that's 76. The span of years between 1945, Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings, and 2021. Um, seven times eight is 126, 120th of the 2520. You still call it my name? No. Seven times 21 equals 147. That's the age of Jacob's at his death. Eight times 15 is 120, probationary time. And 10 times 22 is 220, restoration. Um, and then we'll deal with some of these other things here. So, so we have this 700 years. Now, it brings us back to 77, 777 AD. So 777 AD. That lines up with the midnight cry, August 8th. 1844. So that is, and that's because we're using 70 days at the bottom, right? So you have 700 years at the top. And that again is pretty profound. So we have the 777, which is what our chiasm is about. Now, if you take uh, 777, he has here uh, 1022 years from 77. 777 AD to 1798. And 1022 is a symbol of October 22nd, right? So, so again, you have these interlocking spans and these interlocking dates. They're tied together. Now, uh, is there anything I've missed here other than some of the things dealing with 1477? Anything that that I've missed? Just trying to think this through. Okay, so let's look at fourteen seventy seven itself. So the 1,477 years from the Sunday law to the time of the end, um, 
1477 divided by seven is 211. Right? Mm -hmm. So we have 211 and 211 is Stephen Jameson's birthday. That is February 11th is his birthday. So he's the one who found this. His birthday is in there. Now also 1477, there's a thing called Euler's Totient. So Euler spelled E-U-L-E-R. He was a mathematician and he had come to understand that you could, he used the symbol phi so just like we have with uh, Fibonacci sequence, we have phi as a symbol. Euler used that as well. So five times n times a number. And, and with this uh, Euler's totient, you could figure out all the coprimes, the numbers that, how many numbers have coprimes with any number. So it, it's a useful, useful function in certain types of computer programming and so forth. It's not something we use every day. So Stephen says it's kind of obscure. So he didn't think it was that significant. But I'll show you here. And we got more messages here. Well, well, Pat asks, hey, my birthday is, um, your, your birthday is June 22nd or February 26th? February 26th. Okay. But if you took it as 622, that's June 22nd. And that's um, Samuel Snow's, uh, uh, the, the date that he wrote his Pentecost letter. It's also the symbol for, for Future for America, 622. June 22nd. Yeah, Jeff got his big uh, donation to start the school. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. So Iran mentions that, yeah. It's also 86 days is two months and 26 days. So 86 is a symbol of August 6th. So if you um, count 86 days, it would be two months of 30 days and 26. So, so yeah, so two, 226 is, is uh, definitely a prophetic symbol. Um, yeah, so there's lots of different things dealing with June 22nd, Operation Barbarossa um, in 1941. And Angela says her, her oldest daughter's granddaughter's birthday. So there's lots of different things. Samuel Snow's letters, all kinds of things. We actually have it as a center of the 777 chiasm um, uh, between these two different June, 20, uh, June 22nd dates is the, the 13th back tune on the Mayan calendar. So there's all these structures and all these significance of these numbers. And when it comes to people's birthdays, um, it shouldn't surprise us that our birthdays are part of these symbols. But we also know that it's not just that birthdays show up as symbols, they also show up as part of, of structures. And, and it's much more significant when you have a structure because you can have just coincidences of of numbers. Coincidences of numbers occur all the time. But coincidences of numbers that are confirmed by structures that repeat over and over, such as we see on this, this chart um, that Stephen did, that you could take Millerite history and just lay it on the bottom from the Sunday law uh, to the structure that goes to 1798. It's extremely profound. So this is not just some, you know, coincidence. It is actually designed, right? So this is something that's designed. Now, uh, I just wanted to show you Euler's Totient. Uh, so I have a website where I can do this calculation. I'll make it a bit bigger and I'll link, uh, share this. So there's probably other websites I could do the same thing with. But this just happens to be one I find uh, convenient to use. So what I do, it, it explains all about, it's a math site. Um, and, and so what I do is I put this number 1477 here and I wanna calculate phi n. Um, so then when I click on here, it's gonna say that phi in brackets here, 1477 equals 1260. So 
that Euler's totient produces this number um, cannot just be seen as some random fact. It has to be seen as something that uh, is profound in regard to 1477 as a number, because the fact that it exists within this 1260 years, like if we just had 1477 and we found it had it, it produced 1260, it would be an interesting number. But now it's part of a structure. And it's a structure that's pointing to October 22nd, 1844 here on the bottom and 321 years before the time of the end connected to the Sunday law that creates this 1477 years. So, so this just becomes extremely, it is not chance. So that's the, that's the most that I can say about it. You could not have chance produce this. Um, you would much more likely have life come about by chance uh, than, than this occur by chance because the mathematical and probabilities are just astounding. So the question is, what does this mean? Now, this is related to the week of Christ. So when we say that he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, who are we talking about? Who confirms the covenant with many for one week? It's a simple question. Christ. Okay, Christ. And how old is he when he begins that week? Thirty, right? And we know that the two twelve sixties are a counterfeit week. That is, the papacy has a counterfeit week. So what we're doing right now is we're not studying the week of Christ. We're starting the week, the satanic covenant week the satanic covenant week has the 30 years in the middle of that week rather than at the beginning and, and it's the it's the 30 years for the papacy from the taking away of the daily to the setting up of the papal dominion and so that midst of the week here is 538 now where is it lining up with it's lining up with what what chiasm is this lining up with in millerite history Midnight Cry, you said, I think. Okay, well, it's lining up with the chiasm of the Midnight Cry with July uh, 21st as the center. So we have already established that Christ's chiasm, his week, we can line it up with Millerite history. Now, we, we've done it in different ways because there's, there's actually three chiasms in Millerite history two in Samuel Snow's letters or Samuel Snow's history and, and one in Samuel Snow at midnight saying that it's midnight on July 20, 21st. So on July 21st, he declares it is midnight because it's midway. He just doesn't know that it's exactly to the day midnight because he's, he's just not thinking that way. Um, but we can see that the center of that chiasm of the 1260 lines up with 538, right? So the 1260 is 538, I mean, lines up with July 21st. Right. Nobody planned this, right? So you can see that these chiasms of, of from Samuel Snow's letters is tied into this chiasm, the counterfeit chiasm. But that chiasm is a counterfeit of Christ's week. So what we're doing is we're tying Christ's week to Millerite history. But we're also seeing that there's another power and this power is the papal power that's the center of this chiasm when it begins its 1260. So the time of the end is going to begin Millerite history. But even before Millerite history begins, we have this structure that is basically foreseeing what's going to happen in Millerite history. So this is a, a question. If God put this in here, in this structure of the Sunday law. And in 1798, um, we would be able to uh, see this structure. That is, we'd see 187 years to the taking away of the daily and 217 years to papal dominion. 
why do you think it's a chance that that these uh, these dates showed up in Millerite history, or is it design? Because this isn't just after the fact. This had to have been built in, built in before the events of Millerite history. You understand what I'm saying? So God foresaw this. Now, does that take away personal choice or free will? It's a question um, that you know we should have an obvious answer to. But I'm just asking the question because it's something that people ask. So if God knew exactly which dates in Millerite history events would occur, did he take away then the free will of those participants? I wouldn't see it that way. No, because they didn't, they didn't know at the time what was going on. Right. Now, I use this illustration. Now, in the past, philosophers use different illustrations. They'd say like an author writing a book. But the one I use is when you record a sporting event on your, however people do that on TVs, they got some kind of thing they can record TV and, and you watch the game. Is the game predetermined when you watch it, even if you don't know the outcome? Is the game predetermined? So you record the game and you're gonna watch it like 12 hours later. Is the game predetermined? Is the outcome predetermined? And just because you're recording it? Well, I'm and, re relative to where you are in time, yeah, it's predetermined. Right. So it's predetermined. No matter how many times I watch that recorded game, it's going to end up the same way. Mm -hmm. Now, the players, did they have a free choice in their events? Did, was it predetermined for the players? No, well, they just they just played the game. So it wasn't predetermined, right? Just because I recorded it, does it mean, and the recording is predetermined, doesn't mean that the actions of the participants at the time were predetermined. Now here, God stands outside of time, right? So God is not a part of time. He's not a part of this universe. Time is something that God created. And so God stands outside of time. So in a sense, records events before they happen, right? He knows the end from the beginning. So God, this shows that God knows these things because he's given us these time prophecies that we had no idea. Nobody could have thought, you know, we could have put these dates here until recently, but we can. And the fact that we can means that God foresaw these events, right? And he built it into these time prophecies. But that doesn't take away the individual's free choice. The individual act acted as a free moral agent. Now, free will only exists if God gives it to us. That is, if we lived in a deterministic universe, all of your choices would have been predetermined. But we don't. We live in a universe where God gives us choice. And yet, you could argue that the universe is in some ways predetermined because God has already recorded it on his VCR or whatever things they are um, that people use to record things, right? So God's already recorded history, but it doesn't mean that those participants uh, didn't have a free will. They actually did because God gave it to them. He gave us a choice. And, and some people have a hard time with that. You know, it's a philosophical question, but it's something that's important to understand that just because there's time prophecies and they are fulfilled in a certain event, it doesn't take away from the individual's free choice. Uh, hi, Captain Caleb. So um, I don't know if he just showed up, but uh, he's missed some stuff, so. So now we have this, this time of the end. Now, I'm going to spend some time uh, looking at this because I believe that we can add, we can extend this. Now, one of the things that we could do um, is, is we could look at these different spans of time. Now, for instance, I talked about the 217 years. 
If I added 217 years to 1798, what year would that bring me to? Twenty fifteen. Okay, twenty fifteen. Now, what if I did it inclusively? It bring me to twenty fourteen, correct? Mm -hmm. Now, what what did Parminder predict in twenty fourteen? Sunday law. Okay, so I can take this Sunday law of Constantine, and I can actually attach it to twenty fourteen. Now, did a Sunday law happen in twenty fourteen? Okay, Heidi says no. Okay, I'm gonna ask another question. What is the Sunday law in Millerite history? What way mark in Millerite history lines up with the Sunday law? October 22. Tenth day of the seventh month. Okay, the tenth day of the seventh month. So Jeff has always taken this line. First day of the first month's 9-11. The 21st day of the seventh month, July 21st, is midnight, right? That's the fifth day of the fourth month on the biblical calendar. And then the first day of the fifth month is the midnight cry. That's August 15th on our calendar. And then the 10th day of the seventh month, October 22nd, 1844, he marks as the Sunday law. So he has 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law. So I'm, I'm going to go to the whiteboard here. And, and just kind of examine this a little bit. Um, so are people finding this interesting, what we're doing here? Are you able to follow it? Yeah, somewhat, yeah. Okay. Now, I'm trying to go slowly, because I know if Stephen did it, uh, we would get through it really quick and we wouldn't know what he even talked about. <laughs> um, that's, they go on uh, to the next chart. So, well, it's up, uh, it's up to us to study things too. <laughs> yeah, I know, but yeah, it's just, you have to take time to go through things, some things. So yeah. what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna connect this whole line. So we're gonna go 321 AD. I'll just put March, 20, March 7th. So this is Constantine. Sunday law. I don't know about Sunday law. Yeah, well, Constantine was the emperor of the Roman Empire, and he had the first Sunday law. The Sunday is I the don't know about um, his law, about when Sunday law. Okay. Well, Theodore will have to explain it. I'll have to go through that with you. Okay, Mark? So, okay, so we got here's our 217, here's our 187. We'll just leave out this other stuff for now, and and then we're going to have 1798. Now, in 1798, we're going to have 1844, so we're going to have. A lot of events happen here, but this is 46 years um, that, we, that we're not addressing here in this, in this line. You have the 1260 here. So obviously this is not proportional on how I'm drawing this. And all I'm gonna do is I'm, as Stephen has used uh, uh, inclusive and cardinal counting, ordinal counting. So I'm just gonna count from 1798 over here and I'm gonna to come to 2014 by doing 217 years. I'll do this little asterisk, right? That means inclusive. So that brings me to 2014. So it's like just counting 216 cardinal years. Now, I asked the question, did a Sunday law happen in 2014? Now, part of the problem that Parminder had in establishing this 2014, and we know how he did it, that is, he took 
Millerite history, and we had already done 1863 to 1989 as being 126 years. And we got that from the Mini Mini Tikal Ufarsen of Daniel chapter 5. And he proposed that we count it from 1888, the rejection of the third angel's message, 126 years. And for, because there, there was no Sunday law in 1888, right? A Sunday law was stopped in 1888. So his idea was the Sunday law was stopped here, so it's going to happen here in 2014. But he also had a second witness, and that second witness was taking the Mini Mini Tekel Ufarsen and using 60 shekels to a manna. And so you've got 151 years going here to 2014 as well. So he's going to make this of the Sunday law. Now, there's a lot of illogic in what he did. Uh, in doing that. So I wouldn't have predicted a Sunday law based on his arguments. But at that time, in 2012, we didn't have the midnight cry yet, and we didn't have midnight. So there's lots of things we didn't have, and all we were looking for was a Sunday law. That's what we were looking for. So to just jump to the Sunday law, uh, a big problem was is we believed that we were looking at the big line. But we now know that we weren't, we have way marks that happened before the Sunday law. But afterwards, what did we do with 2014? So I'm going to put 9-11 here. And I'm going to put a circle and a line through that. What do we have continuing on past 2014? And, and remember, with 2014, I also lined this up with the week of Christ. So I confirmed 2014 using the week of Christ. And, and what did I label 2014? If people remember, what is 2014 in the week of Christ? It, it was the seventh day of the first month, right? And what did we line it up with in Millerite history? What did Tabo line up 2014 with? Maybe he didn't quite do it that way, but people were doing it this way. Uh, they were taking the prediction before midnight. Were they lining up with 2014? This was actually probably be more challenging. What was sunset? Yeah, this was the thing they called sunset. At least Chalatu tried to make it that way. But people were lining up with Samuel Snow's May 2nd letter, mm -hmm. which is Pentecost. Now, this is not Pentecost. Pentecost is three days before. But this was found in 2017. And 2017 lines up with the 14th day of the first month, which are not Pentecost. I meant Passover. This is Passover. I don't know why I said Pentecost. Um, I'm thinking, jumping ahead here. So this is actually Passover. 2017. And 2017 is the true Passover, right? Right. So there's a, a false Passover and a true. Now, so I know this gets a little bit confusing, but the point that I'm making here is that these dates, this 2014 here being connected to a Sunday law, we say that no Sunday law happened in 2014, but it's symbolic of a Passover. Is the Passover symbolic of the Sunday law? If you go to the week of Christ, where's the Sunday law in this line? Anybody? Can you see that? At the cross, right? Right. So there's our Sunday law. So that's the Passover. So you can see Parminder was wrong about a Sunday law. But there's the symbols that are being used here. 
And, and that was the mistake that Parminder made and that most of us made is that we didn't understand the symbolic nature or the typical nature of our line. That is, we, weren't, we shouldn't have been looking for the Sunday law in 2014. But of course, this was also rejected by the movement. So this prediction was rejected by the movement. But in 2017, it was accepted again by the movement. So the movement rejected 2014 as time setting. But in 2017, we started to accept that that was correct. And that allowed us to accept time setting in 2018. Because if this was correct, that meant we could set time. Now, Parminder tried to argue there was a Sunday law here. And, and I, I still never could understand his reasoning there. Um, because, because there is, in a sense, a symbol of the Sunday law, but there is no Sunday law. And, and we shouldn't have looked for a Sunday law, and we shouldn't try to argue that there was a Sunday law in any sort of literal sense. But we could see that the separation in this movement began here in 2014. Um, so this, this has to do with our lines. And there's a lot more about 2014 uh, that we would have to address. That, that we haven't addressed yet. Um, so uh, I'm going to do this in some other studies. But the point that I'm making here, if you go back to this, what this does tell us is it's another conf confirmation of 2014. Would, would people argue with me that I'm just stretching things? Or does this make sense that this is a confirmation of 2014? I know maybe people have to think about it a bit more. Well, I can't disagree with you. Yeah, because I still accept 2014 as a way mark on our lines. And, and, and it connects to Samuel Snow's letters as well. Now in Millerite history, October 22nd is the symbol. So what Jeff has done, so I'm, I'm gonna erase this here. The way that we look at our lines, because we talked about this, is that Jeff would take these lines, he'd take the first day of the first month, the fifth day of the fourth month, the first day of the fifth month, and the 10th day of the seventh month, April 19th, July 21st, August 15th, and October 22nd. And he would say that this is 9-11, this is midnight, this is the midnight cry, and this is the Sunday law. Now, when we, when we do that, we know that there's a big line. And in the big line, midnight and midnight cry, what comes after the Sunday law? Close probation. The loud cry. A loud cry. Oh, right. And then you have a close of probation. That's right. So if I look at Millerite history, close of probation lines up with what? In Millerite history. What's the close of probation in Millerite history that lines up with our close of probation as a shut door? Okay, that's going to be October 22, right? So the loud cry lines up with what in Millerite history? Heidi? 1798. Midnight, Midnight cry, cry, right? So the Sunday, line, Sunday law lines up with what way mark in Millerite history? Mm -hmm. oh, right? Yeah, I see it. But whose line is this? Right? The question is that we never asked ourselves is whose line is this? So this is the line. This is the big line. Right? So midnight 
is the Sunday law. So when we put midnight in the midnight cry over here, what are we putting here? What are these events? Who is this about? Levites. That's the Levites, right? Because we're in the line of the priests, and, and the line of the priests are right here right, right now. You had July 18th, Samuel Snow's last letter. So that's the fourth letter of Snow, and there's three days. And that's where we are right now. We're here before the midnight for the Levites. And before the Sunday law actually comes, which is the next way mark, really, in the big line, after 9-11. So this Sunday law, we have these events that happen in Adventism prior to the Sunday law, so we can stand there. But really, October 22nd being a symbol of the Sunday law is not for the big line. Does that make sense? In, in the way that Jeff has done it. When he draws this line... First day of the first month, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law. He's not drawing the big line. He's drawing something that happens here. This close of probation here is a close of probation for seven-day Adventists. It's not this close of probation. So you can see, once again, that if we understand our history, um, we know that 2014 is going to be um, an event in the line of the priests. It's not even in the line of the Levites. It's an event over here. So that's one of the things we're going to address as we go through the studies in the morning, going through the foundation of our message. And as we go through and we look at how the lines changed, the big problem was again, it was one of perspective and magnification. And so we were looking for like the close of probation on July 18th which really it makes sense because we don't, it's just a type of the close of probation. Just like November 9th was a type of the first day of the first month close of probation, right? So to understand our lines, we also came to understand that 9-11 for us is not the first day of the first month. It's August 11th, 1840. Because we're snow, right? So if we're a Samuel Snow, we have to know where we are in this line. And that's what we didn't understand. So I think that what Stephen's doing here is it's confirming our message. But it's confirming parts of our message that we, we tend to ignore. We tend to ignore 2014. And we don't, because we don't understand it. Because it was misused. It was misused by Parminder. Mm -hmm. And it was misused by Chalitu and others. So, so that's that's the point I think that we can see here. What are you doing? Some messages in the chat. Oh. So then the devil is purposely trying to obfuscate 2014. Yep. Okay, and, and you bring out a very good point. It looks like it. So one of the things, and I've I've said this so many times. But Satan mixes, mixes truth with error, and he does it for two reasons. Truth makes error more palatable. And uh, so, tr uh, so truth mixed with error makes error more palatable. But it also makes truth, it muddies truth so that people throw out the baby with the bathwater. So you have some error. And people see the error and they reject the truth that's attached to that error. So Satan has it in both ways. He can make it attractive to one group of people, make that error attractive by mixing it with truth. But he can also make that truth unattractive to those who recognize the error. And so it's something I've always been very careful about. I don't just say, well, something has error attached to it. So it must be all wrong. That's just not how it's done. You know that there's error attack, there's error there. You also know that there's truth there. And the thing is to discern what is the truth. You have to, you have to separate for the wheat from the chaff. You have to discern 
uh, what is truth and what is error. It became a one-two punch. Yeah. And so, so what we have right now is we have this situation <laughs> where uh, some of the comments here are quite good. Um, so one, one is it says, um, it confirms also a closed door at 2019, not a disappointment. Well, I'm not sure what that would mean because to understand 2019, it aligns with the first day of the first month, October, or that is November 9th. So I'm not sure what you mean by 2019. I would think you mean November 9th. And so November 9th is the first disappointment. July 18th is the great disappointment, but it's typical of it, right? So that comes from Samuel Snow's letters. So it's, you know, July 18th is not October 22nd, 1844, except in type, right, in our line. So it's not the Sunday law, because if it was, it, it would have been the Sunday law if it was the great disappointment, because the Sunday law on the big line lines up with October 22nd, or not the big line, the Levites line. So um, now 2014 is 153 years from 1861. So that's connected to the American Civil War. So, um, so we know that there's this connection to the war as well. Um, there's some interesting stuff about 226. <coughs> So there's, there's lots of things that um, we have to, there's, there's so many things that we have been studying and we haven't brought them all together yet. But I think what Stephen is doing with his lines that God has led him to do is he is looking at old things. That is, his lines right now are establishing these patterns and structures in things that we already accept. You know, no conservative Adventist is going to reject 321 or 508 or 538 or 1798. And anybody who has been in, has any understanding of Millerite history can't really reject April 19th, July 18th, July 21st, August 8th, and October 22nd, 1844. And we can't fail to see that these structures are connected in ways that are extremely remarkable. And so now what we have to, we have to do, so we have this, we also see that these structures exist within our time, that is our July 18th prediction, even though it was a failed prediction, was purposeful, it had a purpose, it was to show us something, it was to teach us something, just like it taught uh, the Millerites their disappointments. Wasn't it a closed door in 2019 for the false priests? Yeah, so 20, uh, November 9th was a, that's what a closed saying. door for the false priest, but it's also a disappointment. So I'm not sure why you would say it's not a disappointment, but it's a disappointment because it was November 9th. Um, maybe not necessarily for this movement because we had decided in some ways that November 9th was going to be a failed prediction. And that's the thing that I find interesting because we knew that November 9th would be a failed prediction, but we believed that July 18th wouldn't be, except that we had all the warning signs that it would be, but we ignored them, right? And, and, and people ignored it for very particular reasons. Um, and, and so nobody listened to my warning, not that I didn't believe that July 18th wouldn't happen. I, if I was a betting man, I would have betted that it would occur based on all the evidence. But I was also aware that we had a whole bunch of lines and a whole bunch of evidence that it would fail. And that if it failed, and I didn't want to say, okay, I think it's going to fail and be on, on the outside in that way. But I knew deep down inside, based on the evidence, that if it did fail, I knew why it would fail. And so I was ready already on July 18th to know why it failed. I mean, I understood why it it would fail if it did fail and it did fail so because that was shown us but many people didn't accept that explanation even though i gave the explanation prior to july 18th why it would fail people didn't accept that many people didn't so those people left the message but we have now 
witness upon witness that our methodology is correct because it establishes things that we already know to be true. And you cannot have Satan know the end from the beginning and set up numbers and dates and events to, uh, to establish something in all these time prophecies, all these periods of time in the Bible. Satan has no control over those things. He's not God. Only God could design the universe to do these things. So it's something that we have to, we have to consider. Any final thoughts? I know people haven't been talking too much. I get a lot more stuff on the chats here today. Um, anyway. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. So, so Stephen's going to be doing the presentation Sunday at 1 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Um, and of course, we're still going to have our studies in the morning. Um, but I think this is helpful. This will be helpful for people when, when Stephen does his presentations, because he's going to be dealing with other things as well. And, and I have some work to do because there's some things in his presentations that I want to address that I, I haven't uh, completely dealt with. And the period of the judges, which he presented last week, it's a very, very difficult study. Um, and, and I've been reading on the period of the judges. And it's one of those things, if you have, you know, 10 different uh, theologians write on it, you get 30 different opinions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, it's just to try to sort out all that information and to make every piece fit. It, it's not an easy task. So what Stephen's doing, I think, is a preliminary work dealing with the period of the judges. I don't think we have the final answer to that. But um, these spans of time that he's addressing, these definitely are extremely profound. And so when we have something like this that is an established and that we can line it up on the bottom, I'm still amazed when I look at this that, that we can do this with these dates. Um, you know, this is this is a, a testimony of what God, how God has led in this movement, as far as I'm concerned. So, well, thanks everyone. I guess uh, we can close with prayer. And so let's pray. A dear Father in heaven, thank you for the Sabbath hours, uh, the blessings that we receive that the, the portion, the double portion of your Holy Spirit that's poured out. Um, and we pray, Lord, for each person. We know the struggles that we all face. Um, the battle with self is a fierce battle. And we sometimes think that the battle lies outside of us. But we know, Lord, that, that the battle, the only victory that matters is the victory over self. And so we ask, Lord, that you can work in our lives, that you can um, bring a power of conviction, um, that you can bring light to expose our errors, and that you can give us strength to walk as Christ walked by faith. Thank you for all these witnesses in your word, in history, in the work of Palmoni, a wonderful number and um, we thank you lord for hearing our prayer in jesus name we pray amen